Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring books, books, books. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas. So be sure to check out 1840.org, where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. There is a strange part of, I think particularly in the Orthodox world, I don't think this exists in other denominations, but it definitely exists in the Orthodox world, and it's almost not spoken about. Someone should definitely write an article about it. It would be absolutely fascinating. But what I call like the, the draft year in Israel sweepstakes, where all of the yeshivas and seminaries come to American high schools to recruit kids, particularly, obviously, in 12th grade, to figure out and to so speak draft how they are going to spend their gap year. And this has become almost like the draft combine that you find in the NBA. You literally find something quite similar in a lot of modern Orthodox high schools. This doesn't really exist in the yeshiva world because in the yeshiva world, uh, students take their gap year. The male students take their gap year, I believe, after two or three years of learning in America, and then they go to Israel. Uh, the women, I do believe, go after 12th grade to seminary. But in the modern Orthodox high schools, every single yeshiva and seminary comes into America, and there are these like weeks at a time where students are taken out of class, and they have these interviews with the yeshivas and seminaries. And similar to the draft combine on these interviews, sometimes it is the... A student trying to plead their case of why they should be drafted, why I should get into this seminary, into this yeshiva. And sometimes it is the yeshiva trying to draft the student. You know, you always have these like high profile draft picks of like, oh, this is an amazing 12th grader in, I don't know, SKA, DRS, TABC, Shalhevet, whatever it is. And we got to get them to our yeshiva or seminary. And you kind of plead the case. Now, I absolutely love this when I was in 12th grade. And I was, when I was in 12th grade, I, I, I try to describe myself properly. Uh, I, I was a mess, uh, obviously. Uh, I was uh, religiously schizophrenic, and part of the game for me was almost like playing all the yeshivas against each other and like trying to make myself like as if I was this amazing draft pick, w which I wasn't. I was a total mess in 12th grade, but, but I enjoyed learning Torah. I was pretty good at learning Torah, and I got a lot of great... And I interviewed with all the major places, and I paid a lot of attention to what was said on the interview. And there was an interview that I had, I, I'm happy to say, because it's really, it, it was the most fascinating interview that I had. And it was my interview that I had with Yeshivas Har Etzion Gush, uh, what's known as Gush. It's, I believe it's in Gush Etzion, they call it colloquially Gush, but it's Yeshivas Har Etzion. I did not end up going there, but as an interview, it was one of my most absolutely fascinating interviews. Uh, and there was a specific question that still stands out at me. I was interviewing, I believe it was with Rabbi Mesh Tarragon, who still gives like a stellar uh, class there, the shear that he gives class in, in English, shear in Hebrew, and he's a major, major figure uh, in, Har in Yeshiva's Har Tzion. I have a wonderful, very nice relationship with him. We're not like buddy-buddy, uh, but we, we, we have a very, very nice, warm relationship. And he asked me just an absolutely fascinating question that I still think about to this day. Now, normally the questions you get on these interviews are, I'm trying to remember, they ask you like it for the yeshivas for sure, ask you like a read a piece of Talmud, and depending on the level of yeshiva, they'll ask follow-up questions, and it'll be really intense. I remember my interview with uh, yeshivas Karen Biyavna with Rabbi Mendel Blachman was like known as like this tour de force, like a two-and-a-half-hour interview. He interviewed two of us at a time. I was with my best friend, Yoni Statman, and our 12th grade Rebbe at the time, Rabbi David Willig, still reminds me of how epic this interview was. We were there fighting it out, talking about 
the second and third parak of Tractate Sukkah. I remember some of the topics we spoke about, Kasuse Mechse Shiura, about the halachic implications of certain things that maybe don't have a measurement in, in Jewish law. We sat there, we were 12th grade. I was, I think I was 16. I wasn't, I didn't even turn 17 yet. And a two and a half hour interview. But there was one question and one interview that I still think about. And it was the question that Rabbi Mesh Tarragon asked me on my interview with Yeshiva's Haratzion. It was the following question, which was an absolutely hardball question. He, he was talking about some of the, what are known as the Rishonim, the medieval commentaries on the Talmud that appear in the back of most standard Talmuds. And he said, can you describe to me the difference between the style, the writing style, the questions, the line of questions of some of these different commentaries? And he said, what is the difference? And I'll, I'll phrase it the same way he did it. What is the difference between the Rith Rav Yitzchak Alfasi, early, uh, one of the very early Rishonim, early medieval commentaries, the Rith, the Ran, and the Rush. All of these are acronyms, how we refer to them. We don't have to get into their lives and the, and the specifics, but it, what are the differences between what they are trying to do, how these commentaries are structured, the writing style? Tell me the differences between them. And I remember I was in 12th grade, and I was like, wow, that is a, it's an impossible question. Like, I hope you don't ask this of anybody or no one is going to be able to come to your yeshiva except literally the the superstars. And they do get, uh, obviously, a great deal of superstars. But I remember thinking like, wow, I don't pay attention to that. I don't pay attention to that because so much of Jewish learning, particularly nowadays, is off source sheets. And when you're on a source sheet, you're really just thinking topically. You have, you know, a photocopy of this source and the next source, and you might remember the question, you might remember the answer, but you're not building a relationship with a specific style of writing. You just kind of have a source sheet on a topic, and you remember the big questions that come up and the big answers, and it's all kind of a mishkebabble for you, what is known uh, colloquially as like a likut. It is a collection, a gathering. A likut is a Hebrew word of a, for a gathering, and you have kind of this collection of all these answers to these major questions. But very infrequently, particularly nowadays, where so much of our information is consumed online, on the internet, very often we don't build relationships with specific thinkers, with specific writers, and sometimes it can be hard, unless you're really paying attention to what you're reading and what you're consuming, you're not just opening up the New York Times at, you're not just flipping to the back of the Gemara, and before I get letters, I am not comparing the New York Times to the Talmud. Hold off on your letters, find a a better issue uh, to fight with me on. There's plenty of other controversial things that I say. Uh, That's not worth it, so (laughs) save your time. Don't send the email, the voicemail for that one, but what I do believe is that very often, the specific style of specific writers and thinkers get lost. And this happens in our religious lives. We, we forget the differences between different opinions. You flipped, I don't know, it was on the source sheet. It was in the back of the, of the Talmud. You don't get the nuances of the different approaches of what is the kind of question that a, the Ritva would ask versus the Rajba. What is the difference between different Jewish thinkers and the way they approach specific problems? The sets of problems are different. And we sometimes build relationships with topics rather than building relationships with individual speakers, with individual writers, with individual thinkers. And that's why I loved that question so much. It reminded me of, in many ways, of uh, another test, not to get into yeshiva, but a test that was given at a yeshiva. There is a uh, Rosh Yeshiva, a senior rabbi named Rabbi Michael Rosenzweig, who teaches at Yeshiva University. I was never in his, uh, in his class. I was never in his shir, though. I've listened to a lot of stuff. I have a wonderful relationship with his son, Itamar. We teach together in the Sai Sim School of Business at Yeshiva University. And Rabbi Rosenzweig, I believe, would ask questions on his, on his, um, on his test, what were known as a Bechina in Hebrew, where he would show you a source, and I don't think he would give you context, or he might not even tell you who wrote the source, and you'd have to like figure out what is this talking about, where would you place this in the larger topic, to kind of build that intuition for specific writers, for specific thinkers. 
And that is something for myself, as I have begun to invest more and more into specific writers, I pay closer and closer attention to the style, the approach. What are the types of questions that different kinds of writers spend their time thinking about? And I mean both contemporary writers and older, you know, the classical writers, Maimonides, Rambam, or, or, or contemporary writers, Rabbi Sachs of Blessed Memory. And I'm thinking of like, how do they approach questions? What are the questions that bother them and how do they approach them? And I think that whenever I approach writing, I'm thinking about this, not just the topic, but the rhythm, the style, the tone in which my writing is going to be framed and how I, I kind of piece those pieces together. I remember the first meeting I ever had with what was going to be a longtime editor was with Mishpacha Magazine, where I, I, I was invited by Mishpacha Magazine to start writing a humor column, uh, which were later collected into a book that I've mentioned before, top five lists of Jewish character and characters, uh, a real a medium seller, not a bestseller, but a, but a medium seller. Uh, no doubt about that. But it was a very popular comment. My first meeting with uh, the editors was talking about writing style. And they asked me, you know, like, what's the style that you want to go for? Uh, not in the humor column. We were actually talking about a different kind of column that I discontinued much earlier. And I, and I told them, I said, there are two writers I have in mind in doing this. One writer I mentioned to them, which was actually fascinating, was Rabbi David Wolpe, uh, who's also a friend. He's a conservative rabbi uh, who just, I, I believe, retired from his shul in uh, his synagogue in California. And he used to write these really short columns in the inside of the Jewish week. They were like a hundred words, but they were so insightful and inspirational. And I really began to love his Jewish writing. If you've never read his writing, it's absolutely stellar. He's written a full book on uh, on David, on David HaMelech, published by Yale University. I don't think I ever got around to reading it, but his columns in the Jewish Week on Parsha, on Jewish thought, I I always adore I always love them. And I told Mishpacha Magazine, which was a fairly right-wing yeshiva magazine, I said, David Wolpe was the first one. And I loved it, and it shows you, you know, don't uh, stereotype people's what, what they know, what's going on in the world. They nodded. They knew right away his writing style, his column, but they knew exactly the way he approaches things, kind of a very accessible but still substantive way in which he frames ideas. And the other writer, which they obviously knew because he wrote at the time a, a column for Mishpacha Magazine, which I still believe may be, um, may be published, was Rabbi Emanuel Feldman. Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, who is our guest today, was really the first writer that opened me up to the world of not just understanding and reading a topic, but reading a specific writer. I think very often our relationship with writing in general, with reading in general, is we are topic driven. I want to read about, I don't know, pick a topic, psychology, business, Jewish history, biographies, and, and you pick up based on a topic. Less frequently is we develop a relationship with a specific writer and we could almost without even, let's say they erase their name from the column, from the cover of the book, we would know who it was. The first writer I ever developed a specific relationship with their style of writing was Rabbi Emanuel Feldman. And I know exactly what those columns were. We're, of course, at the end of the week going to email out our favorites of his columns. But there were two columns that stood out. They were originally published by our friends at Tradition the Journal of Orthodox Jewish Thought, where he served as editor for many, many years. He was the editor following, I believe, my rabbi growing up, Rabbi Walter Wurzberger. Um, rabbi Emanuel Feldman took over, and he used to write these notes that were later collected into a book called The Shul Without a Clock, which was named after one of his earlier columns itself that was named after an earlier column. But there were two columns that made me fall in love with his writings, one of which I've mentioned before on this, uh, on 1840, and the other one I don't believe I've mentioned before, but absolutely bears mentioning, and I think it's time for an update. The first column, which I mentioned, which I think is an absolute classic, I use it every time I teach or discuss writing, and that is the article that he wrote called Tefillin in a Brown Paper Bag. Tefillin in a Brown Paper Bag, such a beautiful imagery. And this article, which originally was published in Tradition, 
in the fall of 1991 discusses the sorry state of Jewish writing, where he basically describes being on an airplane and opening up a secular periodical, I believe it was The Economist, and being so moved by their syntax, their sentences, their grammar, and then opening up a Jewish periodical and being crestfallen. The writing was garbled. It was, you know, poor grammar, poor writing. And he says as follows, It is hard to imagine that any thinking individual can be persuaded of the depths of Torah when quite beyond grading misuses, misusages, such as being that instead of since, comes to tell us instead of informs us, brings down instead of cites. The ideas of Torah are presented as jejun, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and puerile language. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that word correctly either. This is a pity. Now, this is the punchline. For Torah is precious enough to deserve elegance, grace, sophistication, and precision. After all, we don't wrap our tefillin in brown paper bags or bind our sifre Torah with coarse, ugly ropes. A worldview which is inadequately articulated not only fails to communicate, but repels those whom it would reach. And he points a finger at the level and quality of writing that is coming out, particularly the Orthodox community, to be quite specific, uh, but the quality of Jewish writing. Now, obviously, there are some fantastic Jewish writers, but when I read this, the imagery, the point, it was so accessible. I was a teenager at the time when I read this. It was a back issue. I was six years old when it was published. But when I read it, I was probably a young teenager, and I was like, wow. What an incredible point. Why is writing so important? Why the expression, the casing, the framing with which we present ideas needs to be just as beautiful, if not more beautiful, if we're going to inspire, to persuade? Because when we case our ideas in ugly coarse writing with improper grammar, etc., etc., it does have an effect on the ideas themselves. And I believe this is an epidemic in the Jewish world, in the way that we express our thought in English. And we need more high-quality writers. Now, the second article that he wrote is also an article. It's about writing, but it is even more brilliant, and it is probably the most brilliant piece of Jewish writing I have ever read, because it shows his command of the different styles of Jewish writing. He did something absolutely genius, and I am begging our listeners, somebody needs to update this. And that is his article in Imagined Symposium, where Rabbi Emanuel Feldman presents, poses an imagined symposium to all of the major Jewish publishers on the following question, what is the role of messianism in contemporary orthodoxy? And the genius of this article, again, an imagined symposium, and we'll send out a link, of course, on the email list originally published in Tradition 1992. The genius of this article is that Rabbi Emanuel Feldman responds to this question, what is the role of messianism in contemporary orthodoxy, in the voice of every publication? And it is just so brilliant. I'll give you just some snippets from a few, and you'll see it. His first response is the Art Scroll Overview. Listen to what he writes in the voice of Art Scroll. Again, this is fake, and he even typesets it on the page like Art Scroll would have typeset it. It's so hilarious and so brilliant. He writes as follows in the voice of Art Scroll. It is the challenge of our contemporary, confused, frightened, baffled generation to strip away the veils that obscure our vision of Hashem, of course, in all caps, as Art Scroll always does. Better still, it is the very veils which are given existence by the one above, and in parentheses he writes, see overview to Art Scroll God, which is not a real volume, but an imagined one, and if you're familiar with the way Art Scroll references their interviews, it is just brilliant. This is his response in the voice of the Jewish Observer, the now defunct magazine that was published by Agudas Yisroel. This is the opening. This is how they respond to the role of messianism in contemporary orthodoxy. The yeshiva world, the world of pure, unadulterated Torah, 
takes every aspect of Emuna seriously, and unlike others among us, does not pick and choose beliefs and principles which are currently fashionable or convenient. Like, right out of the gate, he captures their voice and kind of the slights that they low-key would put in there on other movements. It was really brilliant. I grew up reading the Jewish Observer also, and he really nails it. The next one he does is the Yatid Neman. Uh, which is also really great. He writes, despite, this is the voice of the Yatanem, despite the attempts of certain elements of the Jewish world to say that the Mashiach belongs to them exclusively, it is clear that this is only the voice of the Yetzir Hara speaking. This is when Yatanem was really strong. The next one he does is the Algaminer. I'll skip that one. And then the next two, again, it's so brilliant. It's so great, especially if you immerse themselves. And you have to read the whole article to appreciate it. The next one is the Journal of Halacha and Contemporary Society. And this is, it's just brilliant. This is the response. Meiri, in his comment to Bubba Kama 51A, reacting to the Tosafos in Bubba Kama 51A, location cited in parentheses, in which Tosos take issue with Rashi's comment on Devarim 14.7, in which the Ramban takes strong issue with Rashi, citing Unclus and Baratius 24.9 as support. And it goes on and on. It's one long run-on sentences of of sources, citations, and footnotes. And it is just absolutely beautiful. Finally, of course, like any great uh, humorist and satire, he makes fun of himself, and he writes as follows. This is how he ends in the voice of tradition. Eschatologically, teleologically, and axiologically, the Messiah's coming is the consummation of world history devoutly to be wished. We can only hope that our hope is not a fond one, because as John Milton put it, he also serves who only stands and waits. And that's how he concludes this amazing satire article in the voice of each of the major Jewish publications and periodicals at the time, from everything from Yatin Neman, Jewish Observer, Art Scroll, it's really brilliant. And to me, it opened me up to the question we began with of beginning to appreciate the different writing styles of different writers, different periodicals, and the way they approach and address questions. And that is why I am so excited to introduce my conversation with somebody who really opened me up to the world, the beauty, and what can be accomplished in writing, not just for the intellectual elites, but somebody who was able to write with a wink in an accessible way and really present a Judaism, a Yiddishkeit that is both open and accessible, but deeply substantive and also with a very friendly wink and smile. It is my deep pleasure to introduce a mentor through writing, the great Rabbi Emanuel Feldman. You really had a prolific writing career. You were the editor of Tradition. You wrote two books, uh, more, but the ones that really have had a major influence on me, your collection of essays, The Shul Without a Clock, as well as um, Tales Out of Shul. Um, and and now you write, you're a columnist uh, for Mishpacha Magazine. Uh, you've written for them for many years. I'm wondering, you know, you were, a, 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 I believe, a student in Yeshivas Ner Yisroel. And why did you start writing? You know, you, you were a rav in Atlanta. You were a rabbi. Why would a, a rabbi begin writing for a popular audience? Was this something your rabbeim encouraged you to do? Did you ask them? What motivated you to begin a career, a, a, almost a parallel career as a writer? Actually, I started writing as a kid, long before I came to Nair Yisrael, long before I had any rabbeim uh, to approve or disapprove. Um, I remember at the age of 12, uh, I was I was writing poetry and uh, writing short stories and things like that and submitting them submitting them to my English teacher in high school. So there's something that's been in my kishkas and in my genes for very very long. My mother Aleha Hashalom you used to write poetry in Yiddish, and uh, she's from Europe. Then she came to America and of course raised her children here. Maybe it's in the genes, but writing has always been part of my life. Wow. So when when you began 
uh, you know, you, you were a Rav in Atlanta and you, you have such beautiful stories that you collected from those early years in Tales Out of Shul. I have like almost a, a basic question. Like when you started, you know, writing in Atlanta, where did you like to write? When, when, when would you do your writing? Like what you, you would, you know, well, your, the life of Rav is very busy. Yeah, very. The, the Rav is crazily busy. I used to do it late at night or early in the morning. Um, sometimes Sunday afternoon was a quiet time in Atlanta because everybody was busy with their things. I used that. And not only that, but a book like Tales Out of Shul, I, I didn't really write it while I was a rub. I wrote it after I retired. In other words, the 39 years I was in Atlanta, I was just writing down on index cards you know, abbreviations of what happened and threw, threw them in a box. When I retired and moved to Jerusalem, I took the box with me. It was hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of index cards. And my job was to put them all together in some semblance of order and to write them. So uh, I wrote them after I left the Rabonis, not during my Rabonis. Wow. Okay. That's, that's actually a uh, quite, quite beautiful. What, what I am curious about is, you know, I don't know that I'm the world's expert in Kisve Rev Emanuel Feldman, but I, I may be one of them. I am definitely up there. And I know that, you know, you, you're writing in, uh, in tradition very often got a lot of feedback. You had an article once called Yaakov and Jay's Bar Mitzvah, which described a Bar Mitzvah celebration of uh, two Bar Mitzvah boys, one from a more modern, secularized household and one from a more yeshivish Haredi household. And you compared the two. And I remember a lot of the writer, a lot of the readers of tradition wrote in and were kind of like upset that why did you pick somebody from the yeshiva world? You should have picked somebody from the Dati Le'umi world. And they were very worked up. And I'm curious, not about that article, but about the feedback you get from your writing, both when you write for tradition and when you now write, you know, in more, let's call yeshiva outlets, like a mishpacha magazine. Is there one audience you enjoy writing for over another? Actually, uh, there's one major difference between my writings for tradition and my writings for mishpacha. That is, first of all, in tradition, I only had to write a column as an editor four times a year because it was a quarterly. Mishpacha is a weekly. I write every other week for mishpacha. But the major difference is that as editor of tradition, I had unlimited amount of words. I could go two, three thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> In Mishpacha, I'm limited to a measly eight hundred words. <laughs> so that's a, it's hard for me to do, but it's a great discipline for me to do as well because with only eight hundred words, you got to make every word count. You know, no fooling around and no puffery. You know. So the, the secondly. The audience definitely was different for tradition than it is for mishpacha. But I, I don't keep my eye on that so much. I, I'm hoping that whatever I write will strike a bell with the most Haredi and even with, with the modern Orthodox and even with people who are not from. So uh, I don't have any particular audience in mind when I write. How do you deal with that kind of criticism? I can imagine particularly when you were writing for tradition, there were people who I am sure I've read the letters myself who accused you of being, let's say, too right wing for the tradition audience. Your predecessor, who was the rabbi of my shul growing up, was Rabbi Walter Wurzberger, who had a very different, you know, pedigree and style. Uh, than what you brought uh, to tradition. And a lot of the readers were not from necessarily the yeshiva world. And at the same time, uh, you had your own teachers who were, and, and of course, most notably, you know, I hope it's okay I'm mentioning, your, your, your brother who also contributed to tradition. Your brother was the Rosh Yeshiva in Nir Yisrael when I was there and is, you know, considerably, you know, a pretty strong 
right-wing viewpoint. And I could imagine that many of your Rabbeim and, and family members said, you know, why are you writing to this audience? Or, or how could you have published this? Uh, how could you have published this article or let this in? How did you deal with the criticism, assuming it, it was there? Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, when you were when you were editor, I, I felt that I loved the criticism. Why? Because it fi- it showed that they couldn't figure me out. And one of, <laughs> one of my um, I shouldn't say techniques, but but one of the things in my rabbinet was that the congregation could never figure me out. Is he too from? Is he not from? If he's if he's uh, too from, how come he's such a good tennis player, you know? <laughs> and if he's not from, how come he, you know, he dobbins with the tallest over his head? They were it, the idea was to confuse people, and then to, and to get your message across. So I never bothered too much with criticism. If my right, if my articles, were, you know, received negative reviews, okay, I would take it seriously and try to improve whatever I did, but. As far as the ideology was concerned, this is who I am. This is what I was. And if I didn't like it, they could fire me as editor. That was it. So I never concerned myself. And Mishpacha, too. Not everything I write is, I write is uh, accepted wholeheartedly. There are people in, uh, in Muncie and in Lakewood and in Borough Park who think I'm not from enough, which is fine. And uh, so that that. It doesn't bother me at all. I try to do it the best I can with, uh, with the tools that I have. Is is criticism different for writing and ideas when it comes from your teachers? I, I know for myself, you know, I, I write in different outlets. I've written also for Mishpacha. I've published once in Tradition. I write now mostly for Tablet Magazine on the Talmud. Uh, I write a thematic essay at the end of each tractate. And I think the criticism that I sometimes find, and it's never heavy and I don't have a ton of examples, but it's from mentors and teachers because you want to give them nachas, so to speak. Did you ever get criticism from a mentor or a teacher? And how did you respond to that? I'll tell you, just the reverse. One of the great Rosh Yeshiva, who shall be nameless, because I don't think he would want to be quoted, but it was a na- it was a Rosh Hashiva that everyone would know. Don't, I, me- don't don't say his name, but maybe could you tell us what Yeshiva he was the Rosh Hashiva of? It's too it much information. Your, it was in Yerushalayim. Okay. 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 So, uh, and it wasn't Rav Moshe Feinstein or, or that, like that, but it was a very very famous Rosh Hashiva and very famous Rebbe and teacher. When I became editor of Tradition, he said to me the following. I'm happy that you're editor. He knew me quite well. I'm happy that you're editor because you'll keep them from going off the deep edge, <laughs> deep, deep edge on the left. You know, so, <laughs> and he said, t- don't try to be too from. Don't try to make it into a right wing journal. Just do your job, but keep it from be- coming too left wing. So that's what I did. And uh, I never had any criticism from Rabbeim or from any right wing uh, figures. That I wasn't from it. I'm not from not from the responsible people. I did have letters from you know from individuals here and there, but they're entitled to their opinion. I'm entitled to mine. I uh, I I can't. You know, th- there's a certain warmth and a playfulness that you have with your writing. It's very serious and sophisticated, but always with like a little bit of a of a smile. And there are two articles that come to mind when I think of that. And one is the article Tefillin in a Brown Paper Bag, which is a plea for higher quality writing in the Jewish community. You tell the story of being on a long plane flight and opening up a secular publication. I think it was The Economist. You mentioned it by name and how it struck you, how the prose and the structure and the writing was so clean and clear and how it hurt you, so to speak, that in many Jewish publications, you open it up and it feels like we are placing our Torah ideas, the proverbial tefillin, inside of a brown paper bag, the, this kind of coarse, um, non-sophisticated, non-majestic um, uh, 
outerwear and we're encasing our ideas in poor writing. And it was a beautiful analogy. I'm curious, what do you think of the state of Jewish writing today? Has it changed since that original article was published? I don't think it's changed. I think it's probably gotten worse. Uh, the problem I, made, uh, I mentioned in that article was that <clears throat> if yeshiva high schools are going to have an English program, then they should have a serious English program. And, and if they're going to, uh, particularly in, uh, in English, in writing, because if, we're if the Orthodox are going to have any influence at all on the outside world, on the non-Orthodox world, they have to be articulate, both in speech and in writing. Um, what we have, by and large, is Yinglish. Very few yeshiva boys can, read, can say a full English sentence without saying Yiddish or Gemara words in it, which is fine. But that's not the way to win friends and influence people. On the other hand, one of my pet peeves is that, by and large, the Orthodox seem to have lost the impetus to win friends and influence people. They don't give a darn anymore. The main thing is me, me, me. So that's another story for another subject and for another podcast. <laughs> Yes, it is. It definitely has changed. I mean, so much of the work that you describe in your book, Tales Out of Shul and the Rabbinate in Atlanta, was really dealing not just with the unaffiliated, but with unaffiliated rabbis. I think the most moving story in that book is um, a story at a funeral. It's really hard for me to even remember uh, to talk about without getting a little bit choked up, but you officiated at a funeral. And part of the traditional funeral proceedings is to take the dirt and to cover the grave, the actual, what's known as kavura, the actual burial. And you were, I assume, a young rabbi, and no one wanted to kind of come in and really do this final rite. We would just lower the casket and walk away, and most people were standing off. And you went ahead and started digging and you have this beautiful story where you saw that one other person started to join and help you, and that was the Reform Rabbi. Yes, I remember that very well, uh, and uh, I, 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 I knew him quite well. We were very friendly. He knew where I stood, and I stood where I knew where he stood, but we were still very friendly personally. And I said to him hey, later, what are you doing? Where, how come you did this? He said, I couldn't stand it. That they left you, let you do this all by yourself, and no one even stooped down to help you a drop. They just were staring at you. So that's why he did it. So that was a very, very you know, key moment uh, in my relationship with him. He was a real mensch, though he never really became a Shomer Mitzvah, but that's another story. Yes, no, but it, it, you, you tell the story so beautifully. Another article which is one of my absolute favorites, and I'm really almost bringing it up to uh, almost uh, hope, encourage, pray that you can update it. You have an article called An Imagined Symposium. This may be one of the greatest feats of Jewish writing I have ever seen, and I am really not saying that to flatter you. Why do I say that? It's because it's an article that's an imagined symposium of all of the um, Jewish publications. You do the Yatid Neman, the Jewish Observer, Oliver Shalom, Tradition, the Journal of Halakha Contemporary Society, and you ask each of them, so to speak, what, you know, what, when's Mashiach gonna come? And you answer through the voice of each of these publications in their voice. So your answer for the Journal of Halakha Contemporary Society, which, which always makes me laugh out loud, is one run-on sentence with just, uh, you know, like 20 references to the Me'iri, Ibn, Adlet. It's, it's, it's really hilarious. Uh, it's, it's actually somewhat profound. Your answer for, for tradition almost kind of imitates to me almost Revar and Lichtenstein. You, that's where I first learned uh, Milton's famous quote, you know, those who, um, 
Those they, all, they also serve who only stand and wait. Is that what? Or the, yes, uh, yeah. they also serve those who only, only stand, stand, and, who only stand, stand and, wait. and wait. That is what I first uh, found that quote from Milton. Milton My on, quest- his, on his blindness. On, on his, his blindness. blindness. Exactly. So my question is, have you ever thought of updating that article? We no longer have a Jewish Observer. We have Ami Magazine. We have Mishpacha Magazine. We have the Five Towns Jewish Times and the Flatbush Jewish Journal. Would Have you ever toyed with doing a second round of that article in the voice of contemporary publications? I've never thought of it. Now you you mention it. Maybe I'll do it. But right now, I, I the truth is, I never thought of updoing it, of redoing it, or, or or updating it. The reason is that that article was done in a flash of madness. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, sometimes when I r- write one of these satiric pieces, and I've written a number of them, there's a certain madness comes over me. And I and I ru- rush through it as fast as I can before the madness runs away, you know. And uh, I'd have to push a button of madness to do another one like that. But that sort of one it was one in a one in a thousand. When you were the editor of Tradition, who was your favorite writer to edit and read? Oh well, our, our Rabbi Bleich was really terrific. You know, Rabbi uh, David Bleich, whatever he wrote in, whatever he sent in, didn't need to change, didn't need a, a comma to be changed. It was just perfect. We hadn't, I had no other specific um, writers that um, like that. He was in every single issue. Of course, there were people on the tradition uh, board who felt that Rabbi Bleich should not be in every issue, that because he's dominating it and so forth and so on. But I resisted those 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 comments, and he's still writing for tradition, I think. Sure. Sure. He's he's good. So he- uh, they, there were some amusing incidents when I was editor of tradition, because there was one brilliant guy whom I asked to write a certain article on a certain subject. I don't want to identify it. And I, th- this guy was brilliant, but he couldn't write an English sentence straight. He couldn't say, <laughs> I went to the grocery store without stumbling if he wrote that sentence. So I said to him, look, you write what you want to say. Give me the ideas and I'll write the article, but it will be yours. And he did that. And we wrote, and he wrote the, wrote me a really a bad you know, draft. I cleaned it up, published it. And he got all kinds of encomia on it, all kinds of flattery <laughs> on it. I felt like the stage director watching his actors on the stage while he's standing in the background and they're getting all the applause. But that was fine. I am curious if, again, and, and we'll move on in a moment from, from tradition. I am, I am curious if there is a particular individual article that you are most proud of writing and or editing, you know, you can answer both, you know, something that you edited from someone else or an article that you're particularly proud of writing yourself. You wrote so many of these beautiful editors opening. They had such a massive influence on me. And I'm curious if there are any articles that you regret publishing or that you regret writing. That's it's a very good question. It goes back many years. So I don't really remember that clearly. I do recall some of the articles that you already mentioned, which I'm very proud of, you know, you already referred to them, fill in a brown paper bag and, and the symposium and others. Um, there was one article that took a lot of courage to print, and that was we, we published an article where we uh, criticized the Steinsaltz English translation. Uh, your, br- which, your 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 brother wrote my brother that article, did that, and of course he's a he's a very right wing guy, and they weren't sure they wanted to print it, but they did print it because it it was not an attack on Steinsaltz, although it was the of Rocha was a great person, but it was a critic a, a, a objective scholarly critique of major errors in the English translation, which we printed, but it was over objections of many people who felt that we shouldn't criticize Steinzelt. So that was, I'm proud of having printed that uh, and of our people for going along with it. 
because it was just a scholarly piece of work. That that is absolutely fascinating. I just wanted to let you know that every year on Shabbos Hanukkah that falls out on Rosh Chodesh, uh, without a doubt, your article, I believe it was called, the, is that the original, the Shul without a clock? Uh, I think it's the Shul without a clock. It's it's uh, God and Mrs. Cooperman. God it's and called. Mrs. Cooperman, and every year uh, we remember Mrs. Cooperman, the woman who who during davening would read all of the inserts from beginning to end every shabbos she, she would do that every, every shabbos, shabbos. Yeah. and once a year when it was shabbos rosh chodesh uh, and hanukkah she finally you know got it right so to speak actually and once in three once in three or four years wasn't every single year yeah no. correct once right. in every three or four years and uh to me because my bubby and my grandmother, uh, both uh, did not come from educated homes. You know, my my bubby grew up in North Adams, Massachusetts. My grandmother was a Rebetzin in Portland, Maine. My grandfather was Moshe Bakritsky, from the first Talmidim of Rav David Leibowitz. My grandmother couldn't even read Hebrew, and she was a Rebetzin. You know, and this is in the 1940s, 1930s. And whenever I read that story, I think of my own uh, grandparents, uh, particularly my grandmothers, my bubby and my grandma, who didn't have a strong education. I don't know what they davened, uh, if at all. Um, you know, my grandmother had to pray in English. Uh, the Rebetzin and my bubby did know how to read Hebrew, but but it, it's a it's a fascinating window in an orthodoxy that we don't really think about too much anymore, and almost doesn't exist. You know, the undereducated but deeply committed Jew, and you provided such an eloquent and moving window into that world. Yes, thank you. That's one of my favorite pieces, and it's, it's still, I still get reactions to it every time those three events coincide on Hanukkah. And in my own family, we have a special dinner in honor of Mrs. Cooperman. I mean, just for my Cooperman. wife and I and kids. You know, did so. you write that article when she was still alive? Did she know? No, did she no, see the she was gone by then. She was no longer alive. And not only Very. that, I changed, I changed her name to, pres oh, it's to, to preserve her, uh, her anonymity. You know, I had some interesting reaction there. The, 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 I was praising that woman. Yes, I, I was lit raising, but but a a a very from not very from but very educated. An observant modern Orthodox professor from New England wrote me and said, "Why do I make fun of an old lady?" So she obviously, I wrote her back. I said, "Read the whole thing. I'm not making fun of her. I'm praising her." Anyway, it w it was very beautiful, and and thank God you you definitely seem to be able to respond to criticism, and you know people who who want to find it will always reach out the fastest and the loudest. I'm curious about your influences. Who are the writers that influenced you? I I couldn't I could not say that there was any one writer who influenced me. As I mentioned earlier, I was writing ever since I was a kid. I, I was always a voracious reader and read everything I could get my hands on. And I think a good writer has to be, read a whole lot. And somehow subtly, if he reads, if he reads good writers, that's going to seep into his bones somehow or other. But I, I didn't find any one particular writer who affected me. I did have the good fortune when I was already about to get smicha and I was about 24, 25 years old. I was in Israel, and I had just gotten my bachelor's at Hopkins to, to attend a graduate seminar at Hopkins, uh, which they called a master's in writing program. So I was admitted to that, and we, mostly during the summer months, and very intensively, uh, we were uh, introduced to some of the top writers in the country who used to come in and talk to us in general about writing. You can't teach writing, but you can get a sense for what is good and what is mediocre. Were there any famous authors who came to visit that writing seminar? Yeah, the famous author was the one who wrote Sophie's Choice. What was his name? I forget his name. Anyway, he was very, very famous. 
Uh, I'm going to embarrass myself because I just remember the movie and not the book. So well, I don't want to embarrass well, myself William, in front of you. Whatever it is. William Styron. That's his name. William Styron. S-T-Y-R-O-N. Uh-huh. And, and, he came, and what were the books that you were reading as, as a child, as a teenager? You, know, you, anything, you couldn't identify. Anything, anything I get my hands on. I used to go to a library in Baltimore always and come back with a stack of books and read there. Remember, these are the days before television. And before, um, before the, the thumb driven, um, computers, yeah, iPhone, yeah, yeah thumb driven all, computers, all, all, all the distractions on the eight Saharas. And all we could do was read. And I loved reading and that's it. There weren't any specific writers. I used to read Zane Gray. He was, a, he used to write Westerns, but he was a good writer. Later on, I read guys like Sherwood Anderson. I read William Faulkner. I read Hemingway. I read, Good writers. And also, I took courses. I was an English major in college, and I took courses in some of the top writers, Shakespeare and so on and so forth. But all of that has an influence. But I want to say, I don't consider myself a good writer. I'm still working at it. People think I'm a good writer, but that's only relative to what goes on, go passes for writing today. You know, uh, I can write a sentence from A to Z, from beginning to end without tripping over it, but that, I don't. I'm still working on becoming a good writer. Uh, the, the, what I really admire about your writing um, is that it is versatile. Is that you can write in multiple voices, and I don't just mean the imagined symposium. I mean being able to capture the narratives that you did in Tales Out of Shul, but still write a more scholarly, you know, comparison of the laws of mourning and the laws of of joy, which was another um, another f uh, article that that had influence on me. I think it was called Uncommon Connections in Mourning. I forgot the exact title. Uh, but but I think the versatility, I think a lot of times now what bothers me about writers is they only have one voice they can write in. They're either, you know, they, they write uh, fiction novels or they write scholarship, very high faluting. It's rare to find someone who can write in multiple voices for multiple audiences. Yeah. And that's what I personally appreciate the most. Thank you. I, uh, I just wrote an article about baseball which will appear in Nishbacha next week, the commercial message. Next week, an article by me of baseball. Um, I like baseball very much. And uh, as a kid, I used to pitch. And the coach used to tell me, mix up your pitches. Don't throw a curve each time. Don't throw a fastball each time. Don't throw a slaughter each time. Mix them up. And that's good advice for a writer. You mix up your pitches. You, you can't, when a reader picks it up, he never has, he shouldn't know what to expect. He should only expect something well done, something, you know, carefully uh, thought out, but it shouldn't be the same thing week in and week out. I uh, I love that analogy, and I love, I love your baseball writing. You have one article about watching a baseball game where they cut out the kind of the warm ups and the the intermission so it's a condensed game and you lament how much you enjoy kind of the empty space in between and i believe you have another article where you talk about going to a baseball game and maybe even catching a pitch and get or or imagining catching a pitch and imagining how your brother and congregants would react yeah, it wasn't just a baseball game, though, but it was a World Series game. Let's get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, yeah, that was another very well-known article, which I'm, I, I loved very much. And that is that I went to a World Series game. It was one of the rare times that Atlanta was in a World Series. I didn't want to go, but the Bala bus had third base, third base tickets, third baseline. And he was a nice guy. He was a big contributor and this and that. So I went. Okay. And uh, it, there was a high fly ball, foul ball, that was hit. And it's way, way up high. And it was coming down towards me. And I jumped up and grabbed it, caught it with one hand. So anyway, I wrote about that. I was a hero of the grandstand at that point, you know. But 
I wrote about it. But then my daughter, who lived, who lived then and still lives in here in Yerushalayim, heard about it because it was picked up by television. <laughs> and uh, everybody heard about it. And she calls him. She says, Abba, were you at a baseball game last night? Again, I said, there wasn't just a baseball game. It was a World Series. <laughs> anyway, when I got back to Yerushalayim, this was happened in Atlanta. When I got back to Yerushalayim, I was really scared to walk into the Gros Shul here in, in Bechova Piska in Bayat Vigan, where I daven every Shabbos. Because they knew me very well. They knew my father, all of a sudden. They knew my brother, Zolzain Gazun, Shlita Ravar. And here I'm coming in, and I know what they think of sports here. And that, that's what <laughs> I wrote about. I don't want to elaborate on it, so, but that was, that was the story. It was very, very charming story. I'm, I'm curious, and again, you don't have to, to answer this. I have read both of your writings uh, you and, uh, you know, my Rosh Hashiva when I was in Nair Yisrael, your brother, uh, Shlita, who, who is still the Rosh Hashiva. And I'm curious, you have very different styles in the way that you write and communicate on issues. I'm curious if you each, uh, critique one another or you just kind of like have separate paths and, and live and let live, or do you kind of bounce ideas and, and critique one another's, uh, approaches and styles? Once in a while we critique, but most of the time we do not. Uh, once in a while I ask his opinion about something, and he asks me occasionally opinion about something. But basically, we're independent voices. We're very close, even though we're brothers. We're very close. <laughs> and, uh, I have a brother. I understand that. <laughs> and, uh, but and we uh, we have different approaches to things, but um, we are separate indiv individual creatures. I, I, I really appreciate your approach to everything. If, if you could point to, you know, three English books that shaped you as a person. And again, you know, it's an easy escape. You know, we're, we're going to take for granted that the Torah and the classics of the Gemara, those obviously are the, are the works that, that shape us as Jews and as human beings. But if you could point to three English books that shaped you, what would they be? I'm sorry to disappoint you. I cannot point to three English books that shaped me. I think there were dozens and dozens and dozens of books that shaped me subtly, unconsciously. But I cannot point to any particular one, two, or three English books that shaped me. Is there even a specific passage in a book that still stays with you that you can almost, you know... You can almost quote it verbatim. It, it's such a part of a fiber of who you are. The passage that stays with me was written by a critic in the New York Times who was reviewing a book by Cynthia Ozick, who is a very, very fine Jewish writer. Um, he said that Mrs. Ozick never writes a cliché or a platitude, or an empty phrase. That's very important for a writer to realize. I always look over any article I write, I, I go over and over and over again, make sure, A, that every word is precise and there's not a better word that I could use, and secondly, that it's not a cliche, and secondly, that it's not, it's not just a platitude, and that it... Uh, it moves, the, it moves the story along. It's not just something that I'm, I'm, I'm filling in space with. There's that one line by this critic, um, which, uh, which, uh, which hit me something else, which I just said, the, the cliche, platitudes, and making sure that, that everything is precise. I cannot thank you enough. It really, for me, it is a personal privilege to be able to speak a little bit about writing and your incredibly prolific career. I always close my interviews with more rapid fire questions. If someone, and you've been, you've been dodging this, so I'm going to try one more time. If someone wanted to read a book or an article to learn the craft of writing, what would you recommend? 
First of all, I don't think you can learn the craft of writing, A. B, one of the fine books I read over the years was by Francine Prose, P-R-O-S-E, which is a great name for a writer. That's a great last name, yeah, yes. She's very, very, very good. And she has a book called Reading Like a Writer. And she has excerpts from books, but mostly they're fiction books. And she analyzes what the writer's mind is going through. And that's very, 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 very important for me when I read it. That is fantastic. Any, any other recommendations? Uh, the other recommendations is take your spare time and, don't, don't, uh, and learn as much Torah as you can. The commercial message from God. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, without a doubt. If you could take, if somebody gave you a great deal of money, this is always a strange question to ask somebody who has been retired for so many decades, but, but bear with me, and allowed you to take a sabbatical and go back to school with no responsibilities whatsoever to write a PhD, what would the subject and title of your dissertation be? That's a very good question again. Um, first of all, I wrote a PhD already, so I don't have to write another one. You know. <laughs> what, what was your PhD on? It was My a PhD, PhD in English? PhD was on the concept of Tuma and Tahara, of, of, of ritual defilement in Jewish law and ritual cleansing in Jewish law. Tuma, Tome and Tahar. That was my, my dissertation. So I was really basically was learning while I was doing the dissertation. You did that at Hopkins? I did that at, uh, at Emory University. At Emory, yes, yes. yes I did I my that. master's at Hopkins and my doctorate at Emory. Is there a topic, let me almost rephrase it because you already were Yotze, you have fulfilled your obligation in writing a PhD. Is there a topic within the Orthodox community particularly? You know, you had a platform, you still do, but it, it's it's not of your own making, as you mentioned. But if you, you had your own platform with as the longest word count of your own choice, is there an issue that you wish you or others would speak about more in the community? Yeah, I think my platform would deal with the uh, inwardness of the Orthodox community and their lack of concern with what they represent. Let me put it this way. I think every Orthodox Jew represents God, so to speak. He represents a Kodesh Baruch Hu. People look at an Orthodox Jew as being a representative of the Torah. So the Orthodox Jew has to behave in a different way, in a better way than, than an ordinary person. He has to be a mensch. He has to be, uh, you know, what's, what's the expression cleaner than, uh, than, a, than Caesar's wife? <laughs> cleaner yes. than a hound's tooth. I forgot the expression. Um, and he has to be concerned more about the non-Orthodox Jews around him. Because he is a living example and a representative for good or for ill of what Torah is. And if he is not concerned about the people around him, if he just makes Shabbos for Zich, his only concern is to go to his shtibel and finish early and go home and have his shalat and take a nap, then, uh, you know, Yiddish guy is not going not gonna to flourish. It will flourish when people look outward at the non-Orthodox and reach out to them and try to bring them close. Do you think that the state of orthodoxy has improved or deteriorated, you know, since your years in the pulpit? Well, certainly since when I started out in 1952, at 70 years ago, that was there was no orthodoxy to speak of except in the major cities, New York, Baltimore, you know, that type of thing. So it definitely has improved. It has spread. It has become much more acceptable in the world around it and much more influential. So it has definitely it really been triumphant because it was, it was down for the count. And it's like a resurrection has come up. I think we still have a long way to go, but it, materially it has is, is grown tremendously. It's institutions, it's schools, it's yeshivas, it's kololim. It's amazing. What it, what it has accomplished. I still think we have a long way to go and we, we should not rest on our laurels. 
We should not say, wow, what a great job we've done. We got it because we have much more to do to bring power to the masses of Jews everywhere. My final question, I'm always curious about people's daily schedules. What time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? First of all, I want to ask you a question. How many final questions do you have? <laughs> this is my actual last one. I... What time do I go to sleep at night? Um, let's put it the other way around. What time do I wake up? I wake up between 5 and 5.30 a.m. As a result, I go to sleep about 9, 9.30. So I try to get eight hours. At my age, I need to have eight hours. Um, so that's basically it. I go to bed relatively early. But those who kid me about it, I say, fine, I'll call you at 5 a.m. and see where you are. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for your time and wisdom and for all of the uh, inspiration, uh, thought-provoking ideas that you've shared over the years. And really, on a very personal level, I feel like I am meeting a a Rebbe, a mentor, someone who has guided me over the years and really shaped the way that I approach and think about ideas. Uh, you know, you have a deep pitching repertoire and you, you really always have kept them guessing. And as a model uh, for sharing Jewish ideas, you have inspired so many, particularly myself. So thank you so, so much for your time today. The pleasure. Uh, by the way, I'm a fan of your writings as well. I've read it over the years. You, you do a very, very good job. Thank you very that much. My absolute pleasure. Thank you again so much. And, and I'll let you know when this drops and we'll be Bekesher. Very good. More often than many people would think, I get questions from friends, from listeners, from acquaintances about writing a book. Uh, I am not, I wouldn't call myself a prolific writer. I, I, I'm not, uh, my books don't sell uh, certainly as well as they would in my dreams, uh, but I've published what I think I've done well is that I've published in many different outlets. I've published in kind of more yeshiva oriented outlets like Mishpacha magazine. I publish now in tablet magazine, my series on uh, the themes of every tractate in Dafyomi. I've published a little bit more in an academic voice, like my book synagogue, more of the, you know, friendly, uh, humorous voice, like in Mishpacha magazine. I've published in, in newspapers, op-eds. And I, I, I do think I have a versatility in the different voices, and a lot of that was inspired to me by Rabbi uh, Emanuel Feldman. Now, when people ask me to, I, I want to write a book, I want to share ideas, which is one of the great joys and privileges of my life, to be quite frank, is to have this opportunity to have platforms to share ideas. What greater joy uh, on earth can there be? The question that I always pose to them is when you close your eyes, so to speak, what ideas do you want to be associated with? What do you want? You need to develop a voice where people can almost instinctively associate you with certain issues, ideas, and a way of speaking. I think the real greats, whether in, in writing and whether or not you agree with them or not, just people who really develop a relationship with an audience, find a way of merging both a tone and a topic that you can almost predict without seeing their name on the page. I know who probably wrote this. Uh, I think Rabbi Sachs is a great example of this. You, you don't have to see his name at the top of the page. You know both his style and the types of questions that he deals with. I have a, a friend in Lakewood named Rabbi Ellie Steinberg, uh, who sometimes actually plays this game with me. He will very often uh, text me or direct message me on Twitter with just a passage from uh, a, a Hebrew commentary, whether it's on Chumash or the Talmud, and he would say, guess who? Who do you think wrote this? Who do you think came up with this? And I think it's such an instructive way to think about our own writing and the way we build a relationship with our audience. We, you have to find a way, both in your tone and style, the rhythm of your writing, the how you say it, and also what you talk about and what you say. And I think the people who do this best and the models, and that's why I found Rabbi Emanuel Feldman uh, so intriguing and so instructive, is that he really found a way to do this. And what I find so beautiful about his example, is, and I think what in many ways he perpetuates, 
is kind of a Judaism that almost has ceased to exist. It's like untouched by the, it's like a Judaism that was put in a time capsule in the 70s and 80s that was untouched and uncorrupted by a lot, what, in my opinion, is a lot of the Narishkeit, a lot of the pop culture that seeped into Judaism in the last 30 years. There is kind of a very open, very traditional, very strong, very confident but also very accessible Judaism that Emanuel Feldman represented. In my mind, it's the Judaism in, in many ways of, of Her- Herman Wook, uh, who passed away. Lord, help me if I pronounced his last name. Herman Wook. 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 I'm going to get letters. That was no good. That was no good. But leave it in anyways. Don't, don't edit that out. Let, let them see me struggle. But I think that finding a way and sharing ideas is not just about what we write about, but finding the perfect match of how we share those ideas. And I obviously don't always get it right. Uh, Sometimes I speak about a topic that I shouldn't be talking about. Sometimes I'm talking about a topic that I should be talking about, but not in the right way. Uh, And finding that perfect match of how to do it, I think is really an art that when you see people who have built relationships with their readers, with their audiences, they are doing it like no one else. And that is so much of the magic that exists inside of books, of being not just introduced to new ideas, but building relationships with thinkers, with worlds, with environments that you don't otherwise have access to. And I hope that you appreciate and build your own relationship, not just with topics with that mishkebabble that exists on the source sheet or in the back of the Talmud, but with specific ideas, with specific thinkers, with specific peoples, build that relationship because more than anything else, it will help you refine your own ideas, your own thought process, and the way you share ideas and, God willing, write and share your own books, your own thoughts, and your own articles. So thank you so much for listening. This episode, unlike many of our episodes, was not edited by our friend Dina Emerson, but edited by our other friend Rob. We love Rob. It wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any episode, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. You can also leave us a voicemail with feedback or questions that we may play on a future episode. And that number is 917 720-5629. Once again, that's 917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y, 1840.org. You can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, weekly emails. You want to stay updated. Make sure you click subscribe. Thank you so much for listening and stay curious, my friends.